Hello, friends. Great to be with you. Great to be with you. Great to see you. Thanks for being here with us wherever you are here in the Zoom or in the social media land as we're going live here. Thank you for being here. And uh, this is a very timely topic. And it might look like because it's timely, because it's contemporary, that it is uh, limited to that. And yet, this is the language, gun rights versus gun control, we might use today. But the theme runs throughout Jewish history. As we have shared in our debates, some will be some debates will be actual debates, like we looked at Mayor Kahana and Yitz Greenberg last week, or Hillel and Shammai in the first week. And some will be themes, and we'll look at how the debate plays out throughout history. Before we jump in, let's start with a poll. Your relationship to guns. How do you relate to guns? I am a proud gun owner and an NRA member, number one. Number two, I defend gun rights. Number three, I don't think much about guns at all. Number four, I advocate for gun control. Number five, gun violence is one of the worst plagues of our time and guns are a major moral crisis. So as always, remember, these are always a little bit simplistic to put ourselves in a box, but which one best aligns with your views? And this is always anonymous so no one can see your vote. Um, and if there's two of you in the room, hopefully you don't strongly disagree. Hopefully you're not debating. Mike and Jenny, for example. <laughs> um, so take a moment here. Oh, yeah, and if you're Canadian, oh, you don't have that plague in Canada, Lauren. Thank you. Okay, well, I'm a proud Canuck also. So <laughs> whenever we can say, oh, we don't have your American problems, it always does feel nice. So, okay, take another moment. Um, okay, do we have everyone? Did everyone vote? Let's see the results. Okay, wow. Zero percent in the room currently are proud gun owners and NRA members. Zero percent defend gun rights. Zero percent um, are apathetic. 22% uh, advocate for gun control, kind of a moderate leaning in that direction. And 78% think gun violence is one of the worst plagues of our time and guns are a major moral crisis. Okay. So one of, the, one of the things we do at VBM is we learn critically all sides and we move towards action. We move from learning to action. And so one of the interesting things to do in a case like this is, is to uh, expose ourselves to both sides and understand and critically think and create space for different views um, and also think together about how we, how, how we act, even given the complexity of such topics. Okay, here we go. So as you know, friends, this is a very emotional topic and both sides um, to some degree or another are fear-driven. Now fear-driven is not a discrediting of the ideas. It's understandable. Um, a gun rights advocate may be fear-driven. They're gonna take away my guns. How will I protect my family? How will I protect myself? How will we protect ourselves against those who are, are trashing the US Constitution, our, 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 our American rights. And a gun, a gun control advocate may also be fear-driven that there are mass shootings. Is my family unsafe? Are my children at school unsafe? Am I safe to be in a large setting, right? And, um, and, and what is happening with all these mass shootings and extremists having access to, um, to such dangerous things here? So let's start, let's start with the gun rights side. It is not very hard to base a gun rights case in Jewish sources. After all, the Torah clearly values self-defense. This is the case of the Rodef, the Rodef. It says in Shemot, Exodus 22, 1, 
if the thief is seized while tunneling, i.e. breaking into one's home, and is beaten to death, there is no blood guilt on the homeowner. Okay, now, rabbinically, there are three interpretations of this text. One side says, you must kill the road thief, the pursuer. The other side says, um, you can do it. The third side says, you should not, but if you do, you're not liable. Okay, got it? Those are the three rabbinic interpretations of this text. Nobody, no one says you, um, you are liable if you defend yourself and kill the intruder, okay, in the rabbinic sources. Either if you must strike them down, or you can, but not need not, or you should not, but if you do, there's no blood guilt, okay? Now, the Talmud teaches, coming here from Sanhedrin 71a, well, that's interesting how it's doing that. Never saw that before. That's kind of annoying, uh, but also interesting. Okay, Rava says, what is the reason for this halakha, this, lo this law concerning a burglar who breaks into a house? He explains, there is a presumption that a person does not restrain themselves when faced with losing their money. And therefore, this burglar must have said to themselves, if I go in and the owner sees me, they will rise against me and not allow me to steal from them. And if they rise against me, I will kill them. And the Torah stated a principle, if someone comes to kill you, rise and kill them first. Okay, so that is to say, the assumption is, yes, they're only coming for money, but once money's at stake and, they're, and, and the, robbers, the robber's security's at stake, they will become willing to kill, strike to kill, to protect the money they just stole and to protect their life, which may now be at risk. And so you should treat the robber as a potential murderer or as a murderer, really. And thus, um, if it, once you have any assessment that, that, that this is emerging, you should kill them first, okay? Now, by any interpretation of the Torah, Jewish tradition, at least on the biblical side, clearly allows for and even requires war at times. You can't read the Torah and not see permission and even a, a obligation for war. This is well summed up by the famous passage in Ecclesiastes, probably the most famous pas passage in Ecclesiastes, chapter 3. A season is set for everything, a time for every experience under heaven, a time for loving and a time, and for, a time for a time for war and a time for peace. So there we see um, an understanding very clearly. We don't have to look at the sources. Ecclesiastes says uh, we don't have to look at the Torah sources. Quite clearly there, this idea that there are times um, for all human experiences and times to be pacifists and times to be hawks. This passage reflects a sensibility requiring us to save the life of others, and that starts with ourselves. Perhaps the most radical text coming here, um, supporting and even glorifying the use of weapons, is a midrash in which God is revealed as an even ordained, uh, uh, excuse me, adorned with weapons. The Lord is a man of war. Wow. The Lord is his name. Rav Yehuda says, this is, a, this is a verse rich in many places. It teaches that the Holy One, blessed be he, revealed himself to the Israelites with all kinds of weapons, revealed himself to them as a warrior girded with a sword. Gird your sword upon your thigh, O hero. He revealed himself to them as a rider, and he mounted a cherub and flew. Okay, so friends, this is very interesting because there's two ways to read theology in rabbinic sources. One way is to say, this is a divine manifestation. This is a divine revelation. This is one dimension of God. The other, and that's the traditional way to read a text, the historical or modern way to read a text is say, what were those authors of this text engaging with in society in their time period? that enabled them or empowered them or inspired them to imagine such a theology as God of, as a man of war, okay? So there is, there is an approach to saying this is Jewish theology, and then there's a historical approach to saying 
why are they producing such a God? You can take whichever approach speaks to you more. In any case, here we could say, you want to be like God? Be a person of weapons. Be a person of security, of might, of force. And there'd be enough sources to back that up to say that would be godly. Then again, friends, it is equally not difficult to make the opposite argument from gun rights. That is the case in favor of gun control based on Jewish sources. The Torah requires that we take spe special precautions to ensure that our property can never ha cause harm to another. It says in Devarim here in Deuteronomy, when you build a new house, you shall make a railing for your roof so that you do not bring blood on your house if anyone shall fall from it. This is like the modern law of having a pool fence if a stranger walks onto your property and they fall into your pool and drown, who is responsible for that? Is it the negligence of the owner? Is it the negligence of the stranger who wandered on? What if it's a child, God forbid, I mean, God forbid for anyone, but especially God forbid for a child who wanders on, on onto the backyard, who is responsible? And so once you are the owner of property, you also have an obligation to ensure that the misuser of that property will also be protected. The Talmud further elucidates here. Rabbi Natan says, from where is it derived that one may not raise a vicious dog in their house and that one may not set up an unstable ladder in their house? And that as it stated, you shall not bring blood on your house, as we just saw which means that one may not allow a hazardous situation to remain in their house. Okay, so there the Torah is dealing with a fence on the roof, a flat a flat house where people could go on the roof easily and fall off easily, you know, uh, an unstable home. I guess we have a lot of flat houses here in Arizona um, and uh, ranch style. And, um, and then we bring in the case of dogs. Of course, Bava Khan is also interested in a pit. If you dig a hole in your front yard and a jogger falls in the pit in the hole in your front yard and they break their leg, or here, your dog, is. there's a chazaka, what they call a chazaka. There is a consistent theme of a dog acting violently. If they do it once, you say, wow, we didn't know the dog would bite someone. Once they've done it three times, it's a chazaka. This is a violent dog. And now um, there's a different responsibility that emerges with that, with that chazaka. Friends, protecting ourselves and others from harmful objects is codified in Jewish law. On one hand, then gun ownership could be viewed as halakhically permissible protection. But at the same time, isn't a gun, and even more so an unsecured gun, the quintessential dangerous item? It says in, in, in Deuteronomy. And so too, any obstacle that endangers life, it is a positive commandment to remove it and to be very careful around it. As it is said, protect yourself and guard yourself. And if if they did not remove and set aside these obstacles that are dangerous, they violated the positive commandment and also violated the commandment, do not bring blood guilt upon yourself. So remember, a reminder, friends, in the Torah, we have mitzvot ase and mitzvot lotase. A, a, a mitzvot ase is what you must do. A mitzvot, a mitzvot lotase is something that you should not do. So now we see here there is an ase, right? You must protect your property and, um, oh, sorry, a lotase. Don't have property that doesn't uh, have protection. And an ase, you should actively remove harmful things. And so the necessary precautions create obligations not only for a gun owner, but also for a society and a business collective on selling weapons. It says in the Talmud, and furthermore, it's taught in a Braita one may not sell weapons to Gentiles or the, or the auxiliary equipment of weapons, and one may not sharpen weapons for them. Okay, now let's just unpack this. Is, this is not to be understood as an anti-Gentile statement. Gentiles are evil, but rather in its historical context, um, which is that um, the Jews were a minority that was consistently oppressed and understood um, their relationship as second-class citizens as best, as a violent relationship, as a victimized population, and thus selling weapons to such people outside of our community would clearly come back uh, to, to kill us and potentially kill others as well. So Rashi explains that the reason for these prohibitions is to avoid having a Gentile use a weapon to harm a Jew. 
in our day, this can be read not only as an argument in favor of applying social group-based distinctions in deciding who may purchase weapons, but rather as pointing out the sense it makes to determine whether someone has a problematic feature in their personal history that would disqualify them from being able to buy a gun, right? Should there be a background check? And if there's a background check, who, which type of people should be disqualified from the right to gun ownership? And how about, a, how about a background check on a country as opposed to just a background check on an individual? Which countries should American corporations not be allowed to sell weapons to? Oh, and the same thing emerges with Israel. I'm trying to keep Israel out of this one because Israel is a whole different uh, sociological uh, situation and demographic uh, that's involved over there. But one debate that has emerged in Israel today is around when the Israeli government or Israeli companies sell weapons to states that are, are accused of and potentially guilty of, uh, of mass atrocities. Should Israel allow companies in Israel to sell uh, weapons to such countries? Friends, we read in the Talmud that Rabbi Eliezer finds artistic, non-instrumental value in weapons, while the rabbis with whom he debated draw upon one of the most famous pacifist utopian prophetic teachings about how weapons are disgusting and are ultimately to be abolished. Thus, in discussing the laws of carrying in a public domain on Shabbat, the rabbis appear to really be philosophizing on how to define and categorize a weapon. This is the most famous source, I would say, on the debate of, of how we view weapons fundamentally. Here's what it says in the Talmud. A person may neither go out on Shabbat with a sword, nor with a bow, nor with a shield, nor with a spear. And if they unwittingly went out with one of these weapons to the public domain, they are liable to bring a chatat, a sin offering. Rabbi Eliezer says these weapons are ornaments for them. Just as a person is permitted to go out into the public domain with other ornaments, they are permitted to go out with weapons. And the rabbis say they are nothing other than reprehensible. And in the future, they will be eliminated, as it is written, and they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not raise sword against nation, neither will they learn war anymore. Lo yisagoya goy cherev, lo yimadu od milchama. A sin offering is the punishment for carrying inadvertently in a public domain on Shabbat. So they are dealing with the traditional framework here of carrying on Shabbat outside of an Eruv, okay? And they say it is permissible to wear an ornament. You have a decorative American flag on your shirt. You have jewelry. You have a watch on. These are ornamental and serve a purpose. That would not be carrying like carrying a, um, a sandwich in my hand. So they say, well, what is a weapon? Is a weapon an ornament that is something that enhances the beauty of one's dress? Um, that position is argued, as we see here, by Rabbi Eliezer. This is a beautiful thing to carry a sword, right? It, you, are a, you are a religious person, a godly person doing such a thing. The rabbis say, uh-uh, this is a reprehensible thing. It doesn't represent the messianic era as Shabbat is supposed to usher in. This would be carrying. Okay, let's bracket the question today, I, I think mostly around um, how, how synagogues should or must or should not secure themselves, who should be at the door in terms of security and what, or not, what, what they should have or what should not have, and again, bracket the situation of Israel. Um, but let's look slightly at the Israeli context, just quickly at the Israeli context. Chief Ra former chief rabbi Shlomo Gorin wrote about how a weapon is a sacred religious a sacred religious object. Regarding Shabbat observance, a firearm is no different than a kiddush cup. Oh, and a holster is no different than a decorative spread used to cover the challah loaves. Wow. A firearm is something that is needed for Shabbat observance because it is intended for security, enabling a Jew to celebrate Shabbat in peace. Even though shooting a gun is a form of igniting fire, something normally prohibited on Shabbat. In situations where life is imperiled, shooting a gun is a mitzvah. Okay, so Rav Shlomo Gordon in Israel says it's very different. We don't have the same problems you have over there in America in terms of these mass shootings. We, have, um, we are in a state of war. 
It is only natural to have a gun on one side. And um, this would be a religious item because it saves life. Rabbi Yehoshua Newworth comes to a very similar conclusion, but with a less glorifying approach. A firearm is indeed categorized as muksa, something you don't want to touch, since firing, igniting fire is prohibited on Shabbat. Nonetheless, carrying a firearm on Shabbat is allowed, since it has a definite value as a deterrent, discouraging enemies from attacking Jews on Shabbat. Therefore, it is needed for the observance of Shabbat. Furthermore, since carrying a firearm is a deterrent, there is no need for immediate danger in order to carry one. When the enemies of the Jews know that we are ready to defend ourselves, mobs are less likely to rise up against us. So for Rav Shlomo Gorin, he says, it is beautiful. It's a Kiddush cup. It's a religious item inherently. For the Shmirat Shabbat Kehilchata, they argue, no, no, this is a deterrent. It's not beautiful, but this is about a, a, a deterrent. Oh, now let's see, on the other hand, a story told about Rabbi Yisrael Meir HaKohen, known as the Chafetz Chaim. He paints a very different picture on the role of a weapon. In 1913, Israel Medins was a young boy attending the yeshiva of Radin, which had been established by the Chafetz Chaim. One day, young Israel and two friends went for a walk in the woods near the yeshiva. They carried sticks in their hands. They had found the sticks during their walk. Then the Chafetz Chaim himself passed the boys. He greeted them in a friendly manner and stopped to talk to them. Kinder, he said, never walk with a stick in your hand. You might be provoked by someone, and before thinking, use the stick to hit or beat someone. A Jew should never carry a stick. Without a stick in the hand, physical violence will not be so easy. Part of the debate is informed by cultural context and circumstances. The Chafetz Chaim comes from the shtetl Jew mentality, whereas Rav Gorin is, is writing in a time of emboldened Jewish activism and protecting the land of Israel. Very different context. In struggling to resolve this cross-generational debate, we learn a powerful message from the processes, processes used to build the Beit HaMikdash, the Holy Temple in Jerusalem. This is a fascinating source in the Machilto de Rabbi Yishmael. Do not build them in, do not build them with hewn. In it, the altar, you may not build them with hewn, but you build them, you build them hewn in the sanctuary and in the Holy of Holies. How then am I to understand the verse? And hammers, chisels, or any iron tools were not heard in the temple when it was being built. In the temple, they were they were heard, but outside where they were hewn, excuse me, they were not heard. But outside, where they were hewn, they were heard. Okay, so what's this all about? For if you lift your sword upon it, Rabbi Shimon ben Elazar was, was wont to say, of whole stones shall you build the altar of the Lord, stones which represent peace. Now, does this not follow an a fortiori argument? If the stones of the altar, which do not see or hear or speak, because they repose peace between Israel and their father in heaven, the Holy One, blessed be he, says, do not lift iron upon them. Then one who reposes peace between a man and his wife, between one city and another, between one nation and another, between one government and another, between one family and another, how much more so will he not meet with adversity? So they're saying here, the Beit HaMikdash cannot be built with something which is involved in any way in the sharpening of swords, because that represents a violent tendency. And a holy institution must be built as an institution of peace. And so it can't be involved in any way with something that could be used towards violent ends. This is not about some holy war. This can't be about some holy war protecting this place, but rather we must send the opposite message. Friends, this is relevant, as I mentioned earlier, to our synagogues today. The Shulchan Aruch rules that weapons could not be brought into the synagogue. Quote, unquote, there, there are those who forbid one from entering into a synagogue with a long knife or uncovered head. The tour explains, the commentary on the Shulchan Aruch explains, a long knife, since prayer lengthens one's days and a, a knife shortens it. And we rule that here it implies that with regard to a knife that is not long, there is no concern that the knife will shorten one's days. And so here we see an idea that there should be no weapons in synagogue. Don't tell me this will protect us. 
a synagogue and a weapon, a weapon is antithetical to a, a place of, of prayer. For survival, Rabbi Shlomo Zalman Orbach permits carrying weapons on Shabbat in order to intimidate potential perpetrators, as we saw earlier in another source. And nonetheless, it's reasonable to say that it's permitted to carry a rifle or pistol on Shabbat in order to intimidate onlookers, for it's reasonable to say that at a time that is not wartime, most of a rifle's function is to intimidate, deter, and because of this intimidation, it's considered necessary since it is designated to intimidate. And even the bullets that are in it, since they are inter intimidating as well, they are considered to be part of the gun. So friends, um, it's interesting. It's not uncommon in the state of Arizona to see a, a hired security or a police officer in front of a school or in front of a synagogue with a loaded weapon. Um, I used to attend a synagogue where there was a lay person who stood inside the synagogue at the back of the room with a loaded weapon. And there is a particular synagogue locally, which has a, a hawkish orientation, where many, many, many people in the synagogue are, are locked and loaded. Um, many people feel safer because of that. Um, it's kind of a JDL type of synagogue. Um, and others feel uh, less safe about that, and others are oblivious to it because it's not spoken about. But friends, aside from questions of legal formalism and of religious principle and law, we can and perhaps must ask utilitarian or consequentialist questions. Do guns work? Do they make us safer? After all, it is a mitzvah from the Torah to guard our health and well-being. For, our, for your own sake, therefore, be most careful, since you saw no shape when the Lord your God spoke to you at Chorev out of the fire. Interestingly enough, this is the only time that the Torah uses the word me'od, very, in a prescriptive halachic matter. That gives us a sense of how important guarding our health is. So the question is, do gun, does gun ownership work? Are we and our families safer in 2021 with guns in our homes? Does this biblical imperative support gun ownership or the opposite? In America today, although some profess gun control opponents would countenance a certain amount of regulation, some want no restrictions on gun purchases at all. On the other side, many people who champion gun control nonetheless avoid advocating for the abolishing of all guns. Rather, many people call for what they call quote unquote, sensible gun laws to reduce gun violence. This includes measures like background checks, safety locks, and bans on semi-automatic weapons. Gun rights would still be intact, they argue, as per the Second Amendment, but measures to reduce mass shootings would be put in place. The Washington Post has recorded that in the United States, there have been 163 mass shootings between 1967 and June 2019. But based on a more comprehensive definition of mass shootings, as of only 2017, and there's of course been many more since then, there have been in America 2,128 mass shootings since 2013 alone, about one per day. In addition, mass, much gun violence occurs outside the scope of mass shootings, as we can see from the data that shows that nearly 40,000 deaths being linked to gun-related injuries in one year, 2017 alone. As the gun rights side likes to say, guns do not kill people, people kill people. It is not the guns that enables that, that, that death, but the weapon alone. But friends, guns have had a brutal legacy in America, even prior to an era that seems filled with consistent mass shootings. Consider how guns were used to maintain the institution of slavery and how the Ku Klux Klan and other national terrorist groups use guns to create a culture of terror. On the other hand, a gun rights advocate would point out that guns have maintained the constitutional commitment to liberty and protection of the individual from the tyranny of the government. And the, po and the police use guns, they might argue, has the police use of guns, they, they would argue, has not been about racial injustice, but about societal order, law and order. The Talmudic rabbis on both sides can be seen as eschewing extreme extremism. Yes, a Torah case could be made in either direction with nuance. 
but no case could be made for the glorification of guns or for the neglect of societies and communities and the failure protect, to protect the vulnerable from unchecked mass gun violence. Okay, we saw a little dabbling in the, the glorification, just very rare cases, but in terms of uh, um, the, the failure to protect against mass violence, we will not see that. A brief review of American history, and I wanna to get to conversation. I'm sorry, this is a long one. This is just uh, had to do justice to this issue here. A brief review of American history can help us contextualize where we currently stand in connection with gun rights and unjustified violence connected to guns. The Second Amendment was added to the U.S. Constitution on December 15, 1791, when it, along with the rest of the Ten Amendments to the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, was ratified. It reads, a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to bear arms shall not be infringed. But friends, fast forward about 150 years later, June 26, 1934, and we receive our first piece of federal gun control legislation with FDR's New Deal for Crime. Then in 1938, we saw the passage of the Federal Firearms Act, known as the FFA, requiring a federal firearms license, which was repealed and replaced in 1968 by the Gun Control Act, the GCA, which in many ways broadened the scope of federal gun control and which enacted on the heels of the assassinations of JFK, RFK, and MLK. Let that sink in the trauma that emerged in America during that time period and an awakening to this re new reality of what had emerged. However, pushback came once the pro-gun rights lobby gained power. In 1986, Congress passed the Firemen, excuse me, the Firearm Owners Protection Act to limit restrictions on gun owners and loosen regulations. But a response came in 1993 with, with the Brady Handgun Violence Protection Act, signed by President Bill Clinton. In a, as, a, as assault weapon, an assault weapons, excuse me, an assault weapons ban contained in the Violent Crime Control and Law Enforcement Act, signed by Clinton in 94, lasted only until 2004. Many attempts to renew this ban have since failed. It is a priority for President Biden now. In 2005, President George W. Bush signed the Protection of Lawful Commerce and Arms Act to protect gun man manufacturers. Perhaps the biggest blow to gun control movement came in 2008 with the Supreme Court's decision in District of Columbia versus Heller, which held that a handgun ban and the trigger lock requirement violate the Second Amendment at least in certain contexts. Allow that to sink in. The, the Supreme Court ruled that the handgun hand hand gun ban and the trigger lock requirement violate the Second Amendment. The debate about the use and sale of guns plays out, of course, well beyond the American context. In Israel, as touched upon, for example, rabbinic authorities continue to take different positions as to the halakhic appropriateness of an international arms industry. Some argue that because of the danger inherent in military weaponry, Israel should avoid engaging in the international arms trade, absent a need for such sales to enable arms to be used in ethical war making. The so-called, so of course, so-called, of course, by those who do not see the term as oxymoronic, or to protect Jews. Others have attempted to justify the export of Israeli military goods as a way of supporting the defense of the state of Israel. If you look at the recent Abraham Accords and what happens, uh, uh, America, quote unquote, normalizes relations for Israel with many countries. And part of that has to do with the selling of, of the highest level of military um, uh, equipment and, and weaponry. So who's made safer? It's, a, it's an interesting debate. Rather than celebrate machoism, military might, physical strength, and the ability to defeat opposition physically, we might take heed to a more humble path offered by the military the theorist Lao Tzu. After this quote, I'm going to wrap us up. He writes, good weapons are instruments of fear. All creatures hate them. Therefore, followers of the Tao never use them. The wise man prefers the left. The man of war prefers the right. 
Weapons are instruments of fear. They are not a wise man's tools. He uses them only when he has no choice. Peace and quiet are dear to his heart and victory no cause for rejoicing. If you rejoice in victory, then you delight in killing. If you delight in killing, you cannot fulfill yourself. On happy occasions, precedence is given to the left, on sad occasions to the right. In the army, the general stands on the left. This means that war is conducted like a funeral. When many people are being killed, they should be mourned in heartful sorrow. That is why a victory must be observed like a funeral. In the most charitable interpretation, our debate is one rooted in fear. The one who protects weapons is fearful for their own survival. That is understandable. The one who regulates weapons is fearful for another's survival. This is understandable as well. Perhaps the only way to reach some consensus on this debate is not through the perfection of legislation, but by transforming our culture so that ultimately we live in a society that fosters maximal interpersonal trust. The Jewish people with our millennia of trauma, along with so many more positive historical truths informing us, should understandably have sympathy for arguments of self-determination and self-defense. Yet our people should also have a deep appreciation for removing barriers to health, life preservation, and justice. We must throw off cynicism about the human condition, a characteristic, characteristic that is often perceived on the far right, and naivete, a trait frequently ascribed to the far left. We are neither in a total state of violent chaos, nor are we approaching a nonviolent utopia in which we can easily anticipate that tomorrow the wolf will lie with the lamb. We can yearn for the messianic era where we will beat our swords into plowshares and our spears into pruning hooks, but we have a long way still to go. May we continue to debate to find the appropriate balance in each society, in each era, but to maximize safety by whatever means, even as we respectfully debate. Okay, friends, that was long-winded, uh, but let's, let me pause here and um, to, to bring some voices in the room, instead of me responding to each one, let's hear from a few people at once. Okay, if I can say something um, respectfully as your Northern neighbor, but I wanna add a few comments, both as a Canadian and as a Canadian Israeli, because I did live in Israel for quite a while. Um, Canadians often say that we feel like we're living above a meth lab that's about to explode. And um, most, with all due respect, um, most, most of our guns that are used in gang shootings are smuggled across the border for the US. We know that. I've always wondered when Americans, if they do look at the rest of the world, don't they see that other Western democracies don't have mass shootings? We also don't have this gun culture. So I don't understand why they can't put it together. Then spoken as a Canadian Israeli. I mean, there was that terrible massacre in 2014 in Harnoff um, where two Arabs came in and actually most of the people who were killed were killed by an ax, but they also had a gun. Um, and I've wondered, had somebody been a shomer in that synagogue, it was during the week, and had a gun, would fewer people have been killed or would have turned out into shoot out at the okay corral? I mean, I can't see where definitely, if you have a gun, the other guy has a gun, you can shoot each other in a bunch of observers. So that's how I have feel. I know when I first moved to Yerushalayim and I went to a lecture and there was a man with a gun, open carry, like I actually went to the, person who was running it and I said I think there's a murder in our midst there's a guy with a gun and he says well what's the problem I says people don't do that and he said well where do you come from it's a Canada he says that's your problem but you know I Israel does not have the mass gun problem but guns have been used inappropriately to kill other people um, when they're angry so that's my input as somebody who is not within the American gun culture, which I will never understand. Thank you, Lauren. Um, Thank you. Yes, Eileen. I find it extremely interesting that the perpetrators of the mass shootings, I think 
have 99% of them been males? I don't know of any woman who's committed a mass shooting, number one. Number two, if you notice, and if you draw a picture of all of these men, they basically seem to be unbalanced. There is something in their life, in their makeup, which they cannot confront or solve. And this is how they solve the problem. They buy a gun, they steal a gun, and they shoot people. It makes no sense to me, but that's a mother's perspective. Thanks, Eileen. Good. I'm taking notes on all this stuff. Let's hear from some more folks. Thank you. Questions or comments, agreements or disagreements? Just to Eileen, oh, yeah. they're usually white men. If you've noticed, they're angry young white men. So okay, don't so, get okay. guns to white men. Yeah, so, so, and they had a bad day. Yeah, so 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 let's 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 start there. Um, you know, and and I think uh, you're right. I think that there's um, there are some white folks who uh, people are rushing to find out who the perpetrator was right away, and some white folks wanna wanna uh, demonstrate right away that it's a black person to show that you know to reinforce the idea that black people are, are violent. And many and many people want to show. Oh, is it a Muslim to reinforce that Muslims are 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 are, are uh, naturally violent or terrorists? And others who want to show, uh, you know, that this is that this is a white supremacist with a history of supporting this political candidate or that. And so that th there's this interesting rush to find out who the perpetrator is and what that means about our society. And um, uh, and and to be sure, um, without having all the statistics at, at my hand right now. Um, there is um, uh, there are a number of unhealthy dimensions in our society in regards to violence um, that, that that have to be addressed. And yet, Eileen is right. Uh, what you don't see are are women standing over there, or uh, or like you said, very very rarely. Um, and so that that's an interesting phenomenon for us to understand and unpack. Um, very important. And to Lauren's point there. I think that's right around, around what we're doing in America. I think that um, part of my goal here is to show that with virtually any political debate in America, in America at least, you can support, you can use Jewish sources to prop up either side. Um, so that doesn't mean, oh, so liberals will just dismiss half the Torah and say, look, here's what it is. The conservatives will dismiss half and say, here is, we have to wrestle with all of it and then use it to make meaning in our advocacy as to why we advocate what we do with humility, but still in a robust way. And so I think that regardless of where we fall out, the idea that the second amendment means everyone should have the right to have a machine gun or a semi-automatic weapon, or that no one should have to undergo a background check or no weapon should have precautions like a trigger lock, I think is both antithetical to the Torah and to the, and to the constitution. And I, and I do think this is an area for action, that people should work to secure their families as they see fit, um, and yet also work to secure society in a way that Jews are responsible, responsible to do. Um, Rabbi, I have a question. Great. Do we know if any of these mass shooters were Jewish? Based upon everything I've read, it seems they're Christians of some variety. Or okay, thank you for that. Just before Eileen's uh, question, I saw Matthew was about to share something also, and then I'll come back to that. Matthew? Oh, maybe not. Matthew, I think you were unmuted. Okay. Anyways, so while we're waiting to see if he's going to come back, um, you know, it's an interesting thing um, that Jews end up in the media for... Um, uh, for corruption or crime, uh, usually in a few ways. One is if it is um, uh, somebody orthodox, not only because of an anti-orthodox tendency, but because of the outward nature, the outward piety, the outward, you know, easy, ease to observe that it easily makes the news um, when, you know, 
or you know, you'll see Orthodox Jew guilty of you know child abuse, whatever the case. You're not going to see a headline that that has a, a, a an assimilated Jew saying you know, or or a or or a reformed Jew saying reformed Jew guilty of you know, it it it, it doesn't play out the same way. So one, if if the person is is Orthodox. Secondly, if the person is an is an official in the Israeli government, um, or third, if the person is deeply involved in in Jewish communal leadership. Um, the other the other exception is when um, it's financial. Um, like a Bernie Madoff. Uh, not only was Bernie Madoff, you know, who passed away this week, uh, of course, and I'm not going to comment on any of that, but um, there's a lot to say about that. But um, but not only is it about the anti-Semitic uh, tropes that Jews, tropes are, that Jews are, are greedy and are corrupt. Greedy and, and corrupt and... Oh, Matthew, oh. can you mute again just for a moment? Thank you. Uh, they are, are greedy and corrupt and are, are, are in control of the um, of the entire economy, whatever the case is, and the reinforcements there, um, but also because he was tied up with uh, Jewish communal funds in a significant way. And so, um, and so the easy answer is we, we see very little in America of quote unquote religious Jews or outwardly pious Jews who are engaged in mass shootings or Jewish communal leaders who are engaged in that. Is there some segment of, of other Jews who have been guilty of mass shootings? I do remember a case a few years ago of some Jewish teenager with mental illness who had engaged in such, but I think you're right. Normally we're seeing white, in the case of white supremacists, informed by a right-wing ideology and a, a um, to some degree, a, a Christian ideology. And as we saw in the Pittsburgh shooting, an anti-refugee ideology, which was tied up with an anti-Jewish ideology, um, that Jews are pro-refugee as uh, in many ways and, uh, and um, uh, and so we saw that play out also, also in the San Diego shooting over there. Um, and so, yeah, I, I don't want to overgeneralize. Every type of person is engaged in violence, not just one type of person. Um, but I do think that um, this is not one of the major, you know, Jews have a lot of uh, things to clean up. And I don't think this is one of uh, one of our main ones. Yes, yes, uh, Matthew and then, and then Michael. I'm, I'm going to pass. Uh, okay, great. I'm in I'm in the car driving, so it's hard to listen, okay? Okay, well, well, if you get to a point you can talk, we hope you'll come back. Yes, Mike. Yeah, well, I'm gonna put it on mute now again. Great. Okay, I, I think you have to look at this issue a little broader too, both in terms of, of the nation, but from a religious standpoint, because, it, it, because the question and how society responds to these challenges and problems has become exceedingly more difficult as the split fracturing of our society and the growth of hate and anger, which was even accelerated over the four years of Trump. And I think you look from a religious standpoint, how to respond and deal with this, but also in the issue of how do we as a society come up with a way of dealing this unless we, we can address these underlying issues that, that have so divided and so angered so many uh, of our, our people. Yes, Mike, thanks for that. I think this is really important because, you know, many people think it started in the Trump era. Many people th 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 think it started in the Obama era. Others think Bush and Clinton. But if really, if you go back to the Reagan era and even a little earlier, and that's where we start to see actually the NRA gaining its steam, we see that this is not really about guns itself. It really is about a new conceptualization of liberties and the sense that people are going to steal my money through taxation. Look at the Reagan years in regards to tax reform, right? That the uh, people are going to steal my wealth. People are going to take away my property or my guns, right? I need to re bolster this notion of my personal liberty um, in regards. This also emerges in, in the pro-life movement, which is deeply connected. Now, what's interesting is, um, as you know, the high majority of liberal Jews, by which I mean non-Orthodox, uh, vote Democrat. The high majority, uh, I don't know if it's high majority, the majority of, of Orthodox Jews um, these days um, voted, voted, uh, voted pro-Trump. And what's interesting there is, if you looked at Orthodox Judaism in America a decade ago, there were various issues where um, Orthodox Jews differed politically from the right, from the right. They would say pro-life, pro-choice, we don't fit into either box, we're somewhere in the middle. Gun control, gun rights, uh, we're not NRA holders, we're somewhere in the middle, and, and so forth. 
right? The or, or, just, just, as, just as liberal Judaism in America has assimilated many ways into the Protestant community, so too Orthodox Judaism has assimilated many ways into the evangelical community. And thus, over the last four years in particular, we saw a new commitment to kind of far-right ide ideologies emerging in American Orthodoxy, including NRA, which was, which was, uh, which was abnormal historically. Jews were not NRA members, um, certainly not Orthodox Jews and the like. You know, interesting enough, I taught a class about a decade ago in Manhattan at an Orthodox synagogue on gun rights and gun control. And my assumption for the first three quarters of the class was, oh, this is Manhattan, these are Jews. This is mostly gonna be a gun control audience as we saw in the poll earlier today uh, with this group in particular. And three quarters through, I'm seeing some weird reactions. It was mostly uh, men ages 70 and up, again, Orthodox Jews in Manhattan. And I, I was getting weird reactions. And I said, you know, can I just get a, a sense here? How many of y'all own guns in the house? And I would say over 60% said they did. Um, and that and that was very that was very interesting to me. And so part of my conclusion here was not because firstly I'm not in the business in general of pushing legislation, although there's certain legislation I support. But I'm more in the spiritual business of thinking about cultural change and education. And so in that regards, oh, and then we're going to go to Cheryl's question. Um, in that regards. Um, I think the main thing we have to think about is, uh, in addition to the legislation, which is really, really important, um, is, is this cultural shift that Mike is pointing to, and the political shift, where America is so divided that it's creating new levels of extremes, which are increasing that level of, radical, uh, ra of, of radicalism. Um, and so that is something that we Jews, I think, can play an important role in here to validate why people feel, and in particular why Jews might feel that guns make them safer, right? And yet also to, uh, to, have, set, to have sensible uh, approach that helps to secure our communities and our children. Yeah, Cheryl Hammerman. Actually, it's, uh, it's gonna be Stan, we're in the car. Stan okay. has a oh, oh, we don't usually get Stan at this session. So good, let's well, see Stan. We're somewhere in Northern California, Willie. Uh, first observation is that uh, a, a gun is not a kiddish cup. Uh, and as far as the Torah prohibition about taking a weapon on carrying a weapon on Shabbat, that probably should be upheld, except perhaps in Israel, where the safety issues are otherwise. I don't want a congregant in my synagogue who's upset that he did not get the fifth aliyah to be having a gun. So. I, I think it, I think it's nonsense for congregate to. I do think it makes sense to hire security. Uh, unfortunately, I think it's probably necessary to hire security at many of the congregations. It's certainly at the high holidays, so that's where that's where I go on that. But I did think the pro, the prohibition, and I, we can always bend the law the way we want to see it. But I think it's it's pretty clear you're not supposed to carry a deadly weapon on Shabbat unless you absolutely have to. Good, good. So Stan, so Stan is pushing back on Rabbi Shlomo Gorin and saying the idea is absurd that a gun is like a kiddush cup, a religious item to sanctify the name of God, not only absurd, but dangerous. And we would see in our Jewish community, if we did a poll on the American Jewish community, we would find people who say no police, no police or, or security with weapons outside, not, not only because of uh, what that means for Jews of color, who experience police differently, or because of the notion of the violent nature, we would see people on the opposite side who would say, yes, of course, security, and invite lay people to have guns from the JDL folks. And then we would see various middle grounds, such as what Stan has said, lay people should not have it. Um, and yet it, it, it might be responsible and even, even obligatory to have security, especially at times like the high holidays. Our community is not having this debate and we should be having this because there's so many factors at play here. Yeah, Mike, you want to jump in again? Yeah, I just wanted to respond to one comment that Stan said, and that is that the violence and the gun violence and the chance of being hurt is much higher in this country than in Israel. And I think that be, might be something to look at. Well, why is that? How did we get there? You look, uh, we went to something a, a year ago that was said there's more people killed 
in in Columbus, Ohio, than there is in all of Jerusalem in a year or the country and things like that. And in and, and, and Israel, you see the guns, but that's not the factor. This is why I think it goes back even higher to the cultural and, and the other aspects that we have to look at beyond guns. Great, great. And we're going to go to David's question here, uh, but thank you for that. And I think that um, one of the other things that I've read many times, although I confess I haven't studied it closely enough to see the counter argument, is that guns in the home um, are more likely to mistakenly kill a family member, a friend, or a stranger than protect against a perpetrator. I've read that many times. Again, I haven't I haven't studied it closely to read the counter argument, but I've read that many times, um, and 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 all the more so. You know, I there was a you know going back to Israel, there was a supermarket I used to shop at in this West Bank town I lived in. Uh, this is not me making any argument for or against settlements at the moment. Um, but I, I lived in this in this caravan over there for two years, and there was a supermarket I would go to, and there were, and this, this Israeli guy saw a um, saw a Muslim guy in a black a long black coat on a hot summer day, and he saw him open his coat, and the Israeli guy just um, just just shot into him and killed the guy, and it turned out the guy was the guy was was armed with bombs. Now, what do you do with a case like that? On the one hand, geez, you're shooting the guy because he's Muslim and he's dressed in a long black coat. Some are saying, on the other hand, he just saved everyone in that in that uh, supermarket. So there are many dilemmas which are kind of uh, are messy and complicated, um, you know. And yet we know also that there are, are, are there's a racial justice issue involved here as well. Sorry, David, I, you're, I saw your hand was up. Yes, uh, Shmu, uh, Rob Shmuley, I think you are right in that the issue is around freedom, and it's not just. Uh, the, you know, the basis on which the United States uh, came into existence, the concept of freedom. Uh, and I think people are carrying guns, not just to protect themselves from other citizens, but they're protecting themselves against the government. Uh, there's there's you know, worry about, you know, the government going in the wrong direction, taking over our lives. And that's a big uh, part of it as well. And, um, so I, I think that comes into the equation. The thing, the thing that um, the one, well, one of the things that upset me about the about um, the uh, arguments uh, for being able to carry uh, uh, guns unequivocally is that we have freedom of speech, uh, but we can't speak uh, freely at all times either. Uh, you know, we can't yell fire in a crowded theater and there's laws against libel and things like that. And so even with, uh, even with freedoms outlined in the constitution, there are reasonable laws uh, to regulate them and to ignore that, those comments and talk about uh, the need to be able to carry any type of weapon with no uh, uh, ga safety gates around it, I think is is not a um, it's it's not a fair and reasonable argument. Yeah. Okay. Very well said. Very well said, David. Around around freedom and the, and and that and now that that case of freedom of speech with limits is so powerful and relevant. And I, and I think that's exactly right. And I think that that would be another approach in our Jewish thought to look at what is the Jewish notion of freedom as it relates to responsibility um, and as it relates to security. Now, let, let, so let, let me close with just one last thought here around how emotional this topic is uh, for various people, not to mention um, those whose, God forbid, children have been killed in, in school shootings or just horrible things. And I think we see this escalated over the last few years. I know many liberals who in the Trump era felt America was going in a very dangerous direction and thus wanted to become gun owners. Those who also would identify as liberal who felt that, that income inequality is rising to new levels and there's gonna be a mass uprising um, from uh, people in poverty. Um, you know, there's also, we see in the white supremacy circles, oftentimes a, an argument that the black folks are gonna uprise. They're gonna uprise violently 
And the white folks have to be armed and ready for that, which is inevitable, that next civil war that's going to emerge. But what's interesting enough is the gun rights side, one of the most common arguments these days is that gun rights are women's rights. They say women are generally not physically as strong as men or are more vulnerable. And so um, if you care about women's rights, you care about women being armed. And then they show these videos that show a man about to attack a woman and then a woman kind of you know, pulling out her pistol and shooting him quickly, whatever the case is. In the Jewish circle, the emotional element is the never again. Never again is always very, um, always very emotional. But in this regard, as, as David just talked about in terms of fear of government, there's a sense that never again will Jews be unarmed. We see this in more militant, but not only militant circles. Never again will Jews be unarmed when um, the government or an uprising comes for us. And so we need this underground protection and approach. We also see a, a growth in, um, uh, uh, it, anyways, a lot more to say about that dem demographically, but we need to pause. So friends, I wanna close on this point, which is to say, this is once again, a debate we see throughout Jewish history, throughout many different historical contexts, uh, a pressing moral debate in many different ways today around what is my right to self-protection, again, from government, from tyranny, from my neighbor, from stranger, from Rodaif, and yet what is also my obligation to society and to protection, uh, uh, to, to cultivate a just and safe society. It is an ongoing debate. Once again, the answer is, never, is rarely found in, a, in an extreme, but in navigating uh, the, these tensions. And I think we should go out and, and take this into action. We should go out and act in ways that we have concluded um, are necessary to ensure that we Jews are at the forefront of helping to construct a more just society that, that, that eradicates gun violence, er, eradicates mass shootings, um, and, uh, and brings honor uh, and brings honor once again to America for being a safe and just nation. Next week, friends, we're going to look at the debate of the corporeality of God. Does God have physical dimensions? Rambam versus the Rivid. Okay, that's a little bit of a shift from gun rights and gun control, but that's how we're going to play this out. We're going to go from medieval to biblical to modern days. Have a wonderful day. We'll see you tomorrow with Professor Michael Shermer on Skepticism 101, Judaism and Science. Always great to see you at VBM. Have a wonderful day.